I am exactly where I need to be in this moment. I am in complete harmony with those around me who share this moment with me. I contribute only truth and love to those around me. I am being used as a beacon of light to transmit God's divine purpose to others. I will bring peace to this moment. Now let there be truth, love, light, and peace. When one meanders about her tedious life in oblivion, she is likened to being asleep. Yet, there are moments in such a life that are requisite in her awakening. These moments are also known as visions, and if one can maintain vigilance during these moments, one may begin to unravel the tightly woven thread of her life's purpose. And of course, as with anything in life, when one first awakens to a new beginning, she must strengthen her muscles of awareness. This gets easier with time, and when one strengthens a certain muscle, it is nearly impossible for the other muscles to be neglected. Welcome to Vision Class. The web-based open classroom that helps its students interconnect to achieve their visions and find their life's greater purpose. Students can join Vision Class by simply logging on to YouTube and subscribing to the Vision Class channel. For a duration of 12 weeks, Vision Class will air a one-hour lecture every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, beginning Friday, June 7, 2013. So to stay abreast of what's going on in class and to always be aware, just remember you just want to go to our Facebook or Google Plus pages and you want to download the syllabus. Or you can download the syllabus directly by clicking on the link below. We have had some technical difficulties with downloading the syllabus, especially from Android phones. But in which case, if you're having any difficulties, never hesitate to email me at sugarfreemail at rocketmail.com where I will answer questions and I will also be available to submit to you the syllabus syllabus if you are having issues with downloading it. There are six class texts you will need for vision class. Create a visualization by Shakti Gawain. Write it down, make it happen by Henriette Ann Clauser. The Isaiah Effect by Greg Braden or A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. The Spontaneous Healing of Belief by Greg Braden and The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. The whole purpose of vision class is to interconnect, is to share, is to gain everyone's insight and testimonials such that your own vision is fueled. We want you not only to find your visions in life, but we want to use those visions as points on a map to help you figure out your life purpose, your life path. Vision class is updated constantly with information and changes that are vital to each student's success. So it is important that students remain vigilant of these updates on their own. By accessing our Facebook and Google Plus sites, students can find everything from the course syllabus to free downloadable texts by the mere click of a button. To access all Vision Class links for Facebook, simply click on the Notes section. To access all Vision Class links for Google Plus, simply click on the About tab at the top of the page and scroll down to the Links section. Students can also access the Vision Class calendar from one of the aforementioned sections, which allows you a click glance of all dates, times, and assignments for vision class. For your daily assignments, you'll need three notebooks to get started. A notebook of any size to be utilized as a journal labeled as the legacy book. A small notebook that is portable to carry with you at all times labeled as the intention book. And a medium to large size notebook to help you take notes and complete class assignments 
labeled as the Vision Book. You will also need a presentation board of any kind, which you will update throughout class with inspirations and visions you hope to achieve in your life, newly titled the End Vision Board. This class is not, I will say it a million times, if you've never heard me say it once, you're going to hear me say it now, this class is not about what you're able to accomplish. Okay, it is about what you do with your time. So it's not just, hey, I'm able to cover all the text material, Shira, now what? Because you can read all these books all day long and never become aware of your reality. No, this class is about how you connect to yourself, how you connect to your creator. How do you do that? By what you put into the class. This is about how to interconnect with your fellow students and find a way that works for you such that this becomes a habit. And once this way of life becomes a habit for you, you will notice how easy it is to incorporate the elements of this class into your life. This week in vision class, we will discuss all of the tools for mastering your vision with agreements. Today's reading comes from The Artist's Way, Week 10, pages 163 through 178, and also from Finishing the Four Agreements. Today's assignment is to continue morning pages, artist date, and jotting dreams and visions in your vision book, continue printing photos and working on your envision board, and to post the findings of any exercises you have done from The Artist's Way on Facebook or Google+. Welcome to week 10 of vision class. I'm Shira. I'm your fellow student. I'm teaching your course. If you don't already know, and this week we're going to be talking about a couple things. Now we're talking about agreements this week. Uh, last week we talked about discernment and just for a little review, I know that I really didn't necessarily connect how discernment is going to give you your full sense of uh, how you're going to manifest your visions. But once again, this class is very much geared towards you finding your inner self, your higher self, your real self, whichever you know version of this you wanna call it, whatever word you'd like to call it. The whole goal of this class is that you find yourself. Why? Because things that you want, that you truly want, only resonate on the same frequency, which we talked about last week, as who you really are. So if you don't know who you really are, then you cannot therefore attract the things that you truly desire and thus you will continue to attract things to which you get attached, things that are transient, things that are of the ego. But if you can find your true self, the non-ego, the real you that is awareness, right? This, this actual awareness that you are, then what you begin to attract in your life are things that are also vibrating on that frequency. I wrote a letter to a, a student who had asked me um, some questions about vision class and sort of trying to get a better understanding of how to come out of her situation, which was not going so well. And I wrote her a letter and I thought that the letter was just very, very, very on point with what we've been talking about. So I'd like to offer that letter to you now when you go to the Facebook page or when you go to Google Plus, you'll be able to access a link to this letter. This letter would be for anyone who's not fully understanding vision class uh, for what it's doing. This letter will explain everything. I could actually read you this letter and you would get more of a sense of what this class was about than you would get it in my 12 weeks. Obviously, you want to watch the 12 weeks, but you'll get such a good breakdown of the class and what it's doing for you that I think it's definitely worth your time to look at this letter. So that being said, what I want you to keep in mind with discernment is discernment is no longer a tool for activation. Discernment is a tool for practice. As we talked about the three P's, we have preparation, practice and patience, not always occurring in that order. 
As you learned weeks four through seven, you got tools for activating your vision. And you can also technically include meditation in for activation. What is activation? In order to know how to manifest your vision, there are things you must practice. So let's think about preparation for a second. Preparation is needed in order for your visions to manifest. So preparation is what you do all the time, right? That's what you study. That's the information you learn. We've learned this weeks four through seven, okay? So everything that you got to activate your vision was actually preparation, right? And also in week eight, you learn to meditate. So if you add meditation on as an activation step, which is perfectly fine, then you will begin to understand that these are the things that one must do on a daily basis in order to begin manifesting on that level. Not only does it allow you to manifest your visions and your dreams, but it brings them closer to you because you begin to take yourself to the level now of a master or a level of a person who is truly in touch with who they really are, right? Because you cannot use these tools of activation and not figure yourself out, right? There's no amount of reading and writing that you could do that would be too much right? You can only go deeper. So that's the preparation aspect. Now, your practice aspect comes in how you are able to continue to uphold what you've prepared, right? Practice is prep. Okay, now I'm prepared, right? Now I have all the tools, but now I need to practice. I need to make sure that I reinforce this. And that's what you're learning with discernment. And that's what you're learning today with agreements. And that's what you will be learning next week when we talk about belief, right? So all of those three things that we're talking about weeks nine through 11 are going to help you to practice what you and reinforce what you have thus prepared, right? And patience, what's patience? Patience is manifestation, right? It's the, it's the space where you let go. It's the space where you allow, right? And the only way that you're doing that is with the first three weeks, right? Where we talked about Again, we gave you tools, but we really wanted you to define your vision, right? We wanted you to be very clear on what your vision was so that when it manifests itself to you during this, this patience phase, right, that you will know that it's for you. And when you know that it's for you, it re-energizes you. It reminds you that, yes, I am in touch with who I am, right? And that continues the process. So you're not really going to manifest, put it this way, weeks one through three, you're not going to necessarily manifest on a higher level, right? You're simply going to be clear about what you'd like to manifest. In order to actually manifest, you have to learn yourself again. And that is why you prepare. And thus, practice is maintaining vigilance, maintaining awareness. And that's what we're learning with discernment, right? Discernment allows you to stay fixated on the you that you are trying to be. Because if you're judgmental, absolutely, you take that out on yourself and you take that out on others, right? So that is what discernment is doing. That is what this class in a nutshell is doing. Speaking of this class, let's talk about what's coming up next. We're done in three weeks, technically. Three weeks. Now, I will select a valedictorian sometime between now and week 12, and I will not announce that individual until week 13, which is actually the 13th week of the class, if you want to think of it that way. There is a 13th week that you don't necessarily prepare for. Now, I will contact these individuals on my own. Obviously, um, if the person does not respond, they're still going to be the, the valedictorian. I will also contact a salutatorian, somebody who, and, and what you guys will do is, I'll tell you at that time what you're gonna do actually, but you're going to prepare obviously as any valedictorian and salutatorian would, a speech for your class, right? So that's what you're gonna do and you're gonna record it hopefully. And if you can't record it, you're gonna tell me what to say and I'm gonna make a video about it, right? We do our best. So that's what's coming up. Also what's coming up, September 5th is going to be a mass meditation. I believe it's at 7.30 in the morning. Mass prayer. Um, mass prayer is going to start monthly. We're gonna kick it off September 5th at 7.30 a.m. Wait a minute, Shira, 7.30 a.m., does that mean I have to wake up early? Yes, that does, friend. Shira, I'm in school during that time. The times will vary. That's the good news. You might be able to catch it on the flip side because the times will always vary with uh, 
you never know. It could be at night. It could be in the morning. So in the afternoon, we never know. So whenever I host mass prayer or whenever I host mass meditation, all you need to do is check the vision class calendar. The link is in the description box below. The links are always up on Facebook and Google Plus. You can always email me. But the calendar will keep you updated with times and dates of anything coming up. Another thing we'll be doing, monthly seminars where we check back in, where we add new information. It'll feel just like vision class, except it's once a month until I'm able to do vision class two, which is going to take a lot of time, right? And that being said, that's what's, that's what's coming up. I'll give you updates as time goes on. So this week we're talking about um, agreements. And we're talking about agreements in terms of how you are going to again practice what you've learned thus far and the reason this this is important um the reason that an agreement is important well a lot of times people may assume agreement and affirmation are one and the same they're very similar an agreement most certainly is an affirmation an affirmation most certainly is not an agreement an agreement an agreement uh an affirmation is not necessarily an agreement. We'll learn why today. We'll also learn what the four agreements are because obviously if you're going to make an agreement starting there would be perfect. We'll talk about them and we are going to so briefly talk about Julia Cameron's week 10 recovering self a sense of self-protection. Why are we not talking about Julia Cameron as much lately? We're not talking about Julia as much lately because Julia is very repetitive in her information and thus far, if you've been doing the readings and if you've been coming to lecture, everything that you're going to hear from Julia, you've heard probably 10 times by now. So that being said, I'm just going to point out anything that's important. The check-ins are always valid. I don't necessarily do a check-in portion right now, but this is like my check-in right now when I'm talking to you. So. So last week you saw Udoka. I don't know if you remember Candy, but Miss Candy also had talked about her experience at the very beginning. What I want you to start noticing is every week I'm going to drop one of these ladies um, videos into your frame of reference through vision class. And I want you to see not only how they've improved, but all of the ladies you're going to see their aura is very different. They're lighter. What you're going to notice is a change in these ladies, a shift in their aura. Um, you will notice the appearance of their overall, I want to say their overall, um, every aspect about them seems brighter. I mean, even like the way that the lighting looks or somehow the way they're capturing the light looks brighter, right? Um, everything about them feels lighter, airy, uh, which is, as we've learned last week, the frequency on which everything resides. We've also learned that space is actually not space at all. It is everything, right? It is the everything that ev of which everything is comprised. As we talked about, you know, quantum mechanics, when you go lower and lower and lower into the um, circulatory system, you go lower, lower, lower into the anatomical system, you're gonna find that atoms are actually made of space the deeper you go, right? There's more space in the atom than there is of the atom. So the reason that this is important is because that space is not nothing. That space is everything, right? Which is why your breath is everything. You can't see this breath unless you, you know, have condensation in the wintertime, but you can't see this breath typically, right? So you, to, to know that this breath exists and you have no physical way of touching it other than to simply feel it inside of your body is key. That's why mass meditation and prayer is going to be very important. Very important because we're going to touch, get into touch with that aspect. And that is how you become lighter. So that being said, what I want you to notice about Candy is her, first of all, her testimonial is going to take up a very chunk, large chunk of vision class, but I want you to hear what she's saying. Um, it's intriguing. And I also want you to see, once again, the types of things that are happening. They're not coincidences. Those who do the work fully, all right, who do the work fully, Yes, of course, if we go along with vision class and we do our work fully, you're going to manifest. But I'm talking about just those who do the work fully are going to manifest. And that is what these ladies are doing and they're manifesting, right? Whatever their individual dreams are, whether they be physical concrete objects or uh, metaphorical representations of concepts, right? No matter what their visions are, they are manifesting. And that is what needs to be seen. And what's the common theme? The ladies are doing the work. They're finding the time. So let's take the time to give our attention to Candy. Hi everyone, 
everyone it's candy and this is a vision class video update um i want to talk about a few things that have been going on in my life for the last month and a half it started out well first let me give you some background information um i'm not only doing just vision class i'm also doing dr palai's midbrain activation meditations um and he is he is like an Indian yogi that um, posts his videos on YouTube. Basically, his purpose in life is to eliminate poverty. But he's a really, he's a really, really nice, good guy, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I've been following him for the last four years, and this year in January, he decided to start this midbrain uh, meditation series and you guys can look him up on YouTube his um his former names are Shiva Baba or Dr. Treya Shiva Baba so his stuff are very powerful he has a lot of mantras and a lot of chanting so I am doing that side by side with vision class so let's get into what's been going on as far as vision class so the book, um, the Isaiah Effect, absolutely love it. Um, when I realized what the secret what, or what the lost mode of prayer was, I absolutely agree with it. That it, it is the feeling because for years I have been researching on how to pray effectively or um, I've been praying to saints. I've been praying to God, Jesus, the Holy Mary, angels, everything, and nothing basically has been coming to pass. Now, um, when I first started my spiritual journey, sorry, it's my cat. When I first started my spiritual journey about, I would say, um, in 2003 when I met my best friend, started my spiritual journey then. And I used to manifest like, like instantly out of thin air but for some reason um for the past four years i will say that i've hit a you know like a brick wall um so i'm gonna share what my vision is actually my vision is to find my purpose in life my vision is also to find a job that allows me to work in line with my purpose if you get what I'm saying. So basically that is that is what I've been trying to manifest for the last five years. I don't want to get another job where I'm unhappy. It's a dead end job. So what I truly and like deep down inside of me want is to find what my purpose is and to find a job so I can make a career out of it. And I found it. I found out what it is. And it was during a meditation that I was doing about two weeks ago um after reading the isaiah effect you know i was like okay this is it because i have been reciting prayers for like forever and nothing happens because i was missing that feeling i i just i thought that um saying a bunch of words you know to god he will hear me and you know grant my request or whatever but that wasn't it like I was missing the feeling even though he knows what I want you know the feeling wasn't there so let me tell you about my experience with the meditation so I've been meditating for a while um this is not my first time meditating at all however this time around I meditated for an hour and during that meditation, I started to cough. You know, like I started to cough one or two times and, you know, I brushed it off. I mean, I wasn't, you don't really think about anything anyway while you're meditating. So I really wasn't, I didn't care. So, but I was coughing constantly. And then at one point it became unbearable, like unbearable and uncontrollable, controllable. That a word yeah so I couldn't control it so I just kept coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing and this lasted about three four minutes and you know when you're in a meditative state you can't really move 
I don't know if you guys have gotten to that point yet, but I couldn't move. And this was like 30 minutes into the meditation. And um, I remember just freak. I, I, I remember freaking out because I was coughing so much that my throat started to hurt. And afterwards, after that, you know, passed or whatever, I collapsed in my bed because I was, I was doing it in my bed. Actually, I was sitting up in my bed, but I collapsed in my bed. Then I continued to do the meditation. Um, afterwards, after the hour was up, you know, I felt, I felt pretty light. I felt like it was an out of body experience. And like I said, I don't, my experience would not be the same as yours. So it could be totally different. But when I woke up the next morning, to my surprise, like I have, um, dry erase boards in my room. And when I woke up the next morning, I have written all over that board that I don't remember writing. And what I've written on there, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but um, it's definitely, definitely a part of my life purpose. And I figured out what it is. And I think that's the, dire and that's the, the direction that I'm going into. So when I woke up the next morning and I saw all the write-ins on the wall, like I wrote all over my wall. I mean, I wrote on paper, but I, you know, tacked it on my wall and I wrote on the dry erase board and everything. So I didn't do my morning pages that morning because I was just literally freaked out. I was just like, okay, what just happened? What happened last night? <clears throat> so anyways, I went to work and, um... I was sitting on my desk and my forehead kept itching, like it's just itching on like crazy. So you know, I was scratching, scratching. It's this feeling where there's a bug or some insect underneath your skin and it just can't you can't get away from it. Now I have a spiritual friend. Well, she's not a spiritual friend, she's actually a, one of my spiritual um mentors. Um, I want to say, yeah, she's a spiritual mentor. And let me give you a background information on how I met her. Actually, I was, wa I walked into her shop one day about, um, uh, how long, like about three years ago, three and a half years ago, I, I walked into her shop just to buy, you know, candles and incense. Actually, actually, I wanted to buy some sage to clear my apartment. And when I walked in, she just stared at me like, you know, just stared at me, and I was thinking, okay, is it because my friend and I are black? Like, why are you staring at us like that? And um, throughout the whole, sh you know, throughout the whole time we were walking around her shop, she was just staring. So finally, when I went up to her to purchase, you know, I mean, to make my purchase, she said to me, she was like, "There's a large spirit behind you when you walked in," and I was like, okay. And at the time, I think that's the time when my uncle was just murdered and um, I was going through a really, really rough time. And she was like, yeah, this is, she was like, there's a spirit behind you. It's not an evil spirit, but it's, a, it's, a, it's like your guardian angel. And this was a very tall spirit behind you. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and she told me, you know, that's when she told me that I should start meditating more often. And um, she read my energy. So anyway, so she's become my spiritual mentor and I contacted her and I told her about my experience while I was meditating and she said that while the reason why I was coughing like that is because my throat chakra opened and I had, she said that I had like a message to give to the to people or to give someone a message or to say something. And I'm like thinking, okay, who am I going to talk to? What message? And she was like, it's not necessarily, you know, something that you have to say to somebody, but you, you know, you can do public speaking or you can coach, which shocked me because it is a part of what my purpose is. What I figured out is my purpose because I do love to talk and all my friends know that I love to talk. Um, I love to motivate people. I, I It's just my thing. I'm a very talkative person. If I don't talk, I go crazy. <laughs> like, I love 
to talk. Anyways, um, so I told her about my forehead and she was like, well, that's your third eye being open. You know, when you feel sensation in your, in like particular body parts, it's your chakras opening up. And I told her about the tingling in my head because I was at work also and my head felt like someone was massaging it or it was just like I, I could feel the energy moving around in my in my head. And she was like, you know, your crown chakra opened up. So these are the changes that I've went through during this meditation. And I'm telling you, I it was an amazing feeling. It honestly was amazing. Um, I did, I haven't gotten a feeling back during my other meditations, but, um, I do every now and then when I'm at work or I'm listening to like a motivational video or I am searching for something, my, my forehead starts to itch like right here, just right here. It just starts to itch. And, um, it's like a, what should I say? It's like a, um, a sign that I'm on the right path, so to speak. Excuse me. Um, that's what's been going on with my meditation. Now, when I read, when I read the books that share, um, we're reading in vision class, it has led me to another, another, um, topic or other books or other speakers or other, you know, teachers that if you guys are interested in hearing about, you know, feel free to hit me up on Facebook. But, um, yeah, those, that's what I've been really, really going through lately. And, you know, like I said, I found what my life purpose is. And I am definitely looking into careers that are in that field. And it's an awesome field. Oh, another thing that happened. Um, my older sister went through a very traumatic situation um where she was you know she just up and quit her job and you know she was she was at a point where she was tired of being a scientist she was just tired of working with a particular person and she was just really down and out and i hate to see when nice people like generally nice people hurt <laughs> and my sister is nice so I took that time to use my, you know, my skills, so to speak. And within 30 days, boom, she, her life was turned around within 30 days. Okay. And at the end, like, I remember when she got her job offer recently, she said to me, she's like, Candy, you know, we were thinking her, my other sister, she was like, you guys, you need to be like a life coach or something or like a motivational speaker or something. And I was just like, uh, I've been, I've been hearing that for, you know, quite some time. Cause even my best friend said it to me and I was like, okay, I'll look into it. <laughs> so like I said, I've been hearing this from a lot of people that this is my, you know, this is my gift. And I love to hear from my friends and family how much, of an impact that, you know, just my little motivational speaks help them. So anyway, so yeah, that's what I've been going through. I just, I am enjoying, I am enjoying this process. I did not even think that I would make it this far. Because honestly, I don't commit to anything. And I mean anything. I do not commit. I'm not a com. I don't. I just don't. And the fact that I am this far with the vision class is mind blowing to me because I was ready to give up from like day two. <laughs> so anyways, um, Oh, another thing I want to say again, and I'm going to try to make, I'm not going to try to go further with this video cause I'm already at 14 minutes. So look into when I was reading the Isaiah effect, I was led to this thing called, um, imagination prayer or something like that, or imaginative prayer where you take a gospel from the Bible and you meditate on it. But while you're in meditation, you think, you know, you put yourself in the scene and you play it out in your mind. 
but you you just let it play out um and you can ask like if say for example um when jesus was going around healing you know people you put yourself in that scene like you put yourself in the crowd and how you will feel or you know when jesus walked by and what you was what what you would say to him or something like something of that nature it goes along with the um isaiah effect actually with the whole feeling when you're praying like you pray you don't pray to ask you don't ask for something like you you pray that it's already done so like i said these topics that we're discussing in vision class has led me to discover other things and i don't want to you know get you guys off track or anything so if you guys are interested in other stuff that i've discovered you know, feel free to hit me up on Facebook or I can put a post in the Facebook group and, you know, we can go from there. Um, I don't have all the information yet <laughs> because I'm still researching and everything, but it has definitely been a great journey. And, you know, to all you guys out there who are, who has been here since day one, you know, congratulations that you made it this far. And for those of you who where my cat is crazy and for those of you who are just joining um i think you would enjoy this process and like i said my name is candy scott on facebook and i'm on the in the group so feel free to send me an, you know a message or whatever to discuss whatever any other thing that i've said in this video and you know have a good one and i talk to you guys in like three four weeks or at the end of vision class to see if I have another update. Because right now I'm trying to manifest a job. Actually, not a job. I'm trying to ma manifest a career in, you know, my life purpose, so to speak. So I will let you guys know how that plays out. And we'll see. Let us take the time now to thank Candy for her testimonial and hard work and to affirm the following. Candy's life is filled with opportunities to speak to audience who are willfully listening. Ashe. You're the speaker of the house, are you? I can tell you for a hundred percent fact that Candy does the work. How do you know, Shira? Well, I pay attention to what all y'all do. And when I say what you do is, I'm not just talking about participation. I'm talking about what's consistent. And that is very important for what you are going to be able to manifest. So speaking of recovering self-protection with Julia Cameron, we are not going to necessarily go into this chapter in depth. But what I do want you to know is about page 169 there is a boundary setting exercise why is that important you see you see i sound like a young prepubescent uh teenage boy uh when you do something like vision class it is a huge undertaking it takes a lot of time and i was talking to tay the other day and i and she said i don't know how you have the time and then I had to think about it. I was like, how do I have the time? Because I do have it, but I don't really have it. And then you have someone like Latanya, who you're going to see her testimonial update next week. She has seven children. And when people are able to do the work, it becomes very interesting how they're able to do it. So Julia Cameron, um, where she talks about self-protection, whether she knows she's talking about it or not, is actually, when she's talking about setting limits and boundaries, she's actually referring to the way that I approach vision class. Now, to have gotten to week 10 of vision class successfully, I mean, I'm 
I have had days when I've not been on time, but for the most part, we've gotten through all the books. I've lectured on every aspect of the book. I've stuck very true to my original plan and it's manifested. It was something that I did not think I could really do in my heart. But what did I do? I utilized vision class as its own experiment. How did you do that, Shira? Well, what do I tell you guys to do in week one? Visualize. What do I tell you to do in week two? I ask you to do affirmations. What do I tell you to do in week three? Write it down in your intention book. Put it in your envision board. Week four, write about it. Week five, read about it. Week six, have gratitude. Week seven, right? Prayer. Week eight, meditation, etc. and so forth. What I have literally done with vision class is use the vision of vision class as my vision. So everything that I'm telling you to do must be true because I am manifesting vision class. I'm going to break that down another way. I don't think that that went in. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying I don't think that that really went in. You ask for a new job that pays $70,000 a year. That's your vision that you wrote down, right? So you visualize it first. I visualize what my life would look like with $70,000 make that I'm making a year. How would your life be different? Oh, I'd go out to eat on Fridays. Okay, check. You visualize that. Oh, because you can't just visualize $70,000. There's no emotive quality to that. No, you've got to go no emotional properties. You have to go back into your mind's eye and start to pray it, right? You start to pray $70,000 a year, whatever that feels like. Oh, I'll be driving this car, right? Or I'll have this paid off or whatever. Then you affirm it. You write it down in your morning pages every day. I affirm my job making $70,000 a year, whatever it is, okay? And then you go on to week three, and what do you do in your intention book? You take each week, you take it apart. Every week, what can I do? Every day, what can I do towards getting that job? Do I apply? Today, I, I applied for six jobs. Tomorrow, work on my resume. Whatever your small part is, you go and you do that, right? Then you put it on your Envision board. You, I don't know, whatever your ideal job is. Put a picture of it, put a representation of it, put something that makes you feel since this whole thing is about feeling, right? And so on and so forth until you manifest that job. Will you absolutely manifest that job if you do all of those things? Yes, you will absolutely manifest that job if you will do all of those things. Where am I with vision class? I, first of all, visualized it. What does this class look like? How many students are going to attend? I probably should have gone in more detail. Uh, how is the growth of this class? I imagined all of this. Then I affirmed it. Then I worked on it. Intention book every day, whether it be take notes today. You know, and I didn't look at the big vision. Do you know what it would be like if I sat here and look at vision class week 13? I will say to myself that I can't do it. So this whole idea is what you can use when you have no time. You say to yourself, I first would like to visualize what it's like to have time to do whatever. Now, there's a lot of students who say that they don't have time for vision class. There were some, a lot of students right before that that didn't have the books. So we, 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 we transmutated those books into our space. Amen. We have those books online for you for free. Right? So there's really no reason that someone couldn't do vision class. Oh, well, now time's the problem. And then you think about time and you say, we make time for what we want to do. So if we really want to do vision class, we will now take the vision class approach to manifest time. Amen? First, you visualize the time that visualize yourself taking notes in the park. If that's what you want to do vision class at, if that's how you want to do vision class, visualize yourself reading the books. Right? I'm sitting in my chair. I'm reading the book. Okay, affirm it. I am successfully completing vision class in three months. Whatever. What? I, I am successfully completing, completing vision class at the pace of the course, which is 13 weeks. That is how you approach these things. You see, this is about manifesting anything on that wave of consciousness that you actually exist on. And trust me, and trust me, your wave of consciousness is definitely what you already want in the first place. Anything that you've always wanted that you can't get out of your mind or you can't get it off your heart, anything that it is. I don't care if it's a specific mate. And no, I'm not talking about be a stalker. But I'm simply saying to you, if you want it and it's on your heart and it's been on your heart, vision class will help you manifest it because all of these tools and techniques allow you to simply begin to vibrate at that lighter frequency, that frequency at which these ladies are at. 
I'm going to ask you this question about me. Look at me eight months ago. Look at me today. Am I not lighter? Am I not brighter? Right? Do I not feel I have a lighter feeling? Right? I don't feel all heavy and murky. I feel upbeat. I feel bright. Look, these words are synonymous with physical things. When we say bright, we're talking about actual light. But no, light is also synonymous for everything that is. Everything is comprised of light, correct? The way that you're able to perceive. I told somebody this earlier. Just because you have eyeballs does not mean you can see. You might be blind. What's the difference between someone who's blind and can, cannot see and someone who can see or someone who chooses to be blind and cannot see? The difference is that those who can see can perceive light. Once again, perceive light. We talked last week about discernment. Perception is everything, right? Perception is the way you meditate. As I said, when you go into your meditative state, you are not physically seeing anything. So how do you know that you can see something? Why is it that you can feel an image? Why when you close your eyes can you imagine an object as if it were. Why does this technique work in prayer? Because anything that you perceive is what you manifest. If you perceive light, you're going to manifest more light. If you perceive darkness, you manifest darkness. It's about your perception. And that is why all these techniques are important because they change how you perceive. Instead of perceiving in a limited physical world, you began through everything that you're doing, coming to class, taking your morning uh, pages down, whatever it is that you do, you are beginning to perceive differently because you're trying something different, right? I don't look at the world as just physical anymore. If you try to look at the space in between things, and I don't mean that literally. Sometimes people are on the journey to vision class and what I'm saying makes accurate sense to you, but I'm actually saying something on 10 different levels, right? And sometimes people catch it and sometimes people don't. The, the, the ones who can catch what I'm really saying, who can read between the lines, they can also understand this concept of looking through objects. You're not sitting there like that, you know that puzzle that you get where you do like this and then you pull it far away and you can see through it. I'm not speaking just in that way, okay? What I'm really trying to say is if you look through something, right? What is looking through this? This paper is not real paper, right? What is this? Trees maybe, right? Maybe this is a representation of a tree because that's how we got it. Maybe it is, it is a representation of the process that it took to make the paper. You don't just have to look at the paper and see book. Another example, this couch is red. In office hours this week, last week, I asked students to describe the color red without using the wavelength that it resides on, without using anything that is the color red, or without using the word red to describe red. Nobody could do it. Why can no one do it? Because red just is. You cannot describe red in any possible way. There is no way to describe red, except for the wavelength that this color resides on, right? And if you're colorblind, this might be green to you. Perception. Do you see where I'm taking this? Some things just are, but the perception is what changes it, right? If I look at this couch and I see green, then the wavelength that I am perceiving is not the wavelength that it is. But yet it still just is because you still can't describe it to somebody. If I had to tell somebody who's never seen the color red what red is without using anything to describe it, well, damn it, it's a primary color. I can't even say it's green. I can't even say it's yellow and blue the way that you could describe green as yellow and blue mixed together. Red is a primary, you can't describe the color red. Some things just are. But if you can look at things as what they are, you're discerning. And if you can look at things as what they are, you begin to, be, you begin to manifest what you are. Perception. You perceive everything that your reality, is. whatever your reality is made of is, is how you perceive it. I said that earlier, I said it in a different way. Does that make sense to you? What I'm trying to say is, and you know you can rewind the tape if I went too far, and hey, if you don't understand what I even said, you pray on that, you come back to it, I guarantee it'll make sense to you at another time. But what I'm saying is, if you perceive the couch as what it is, and if you perceive this paper as what it is, which is many things, right? The truth of this paper is not that it is just paper. Just because someone tells you it's paper, do you gotta accept that it's paper? You don't have to accept that it's anything, right? But that's what an agreement is. It's about what you've accepted as truth, whether it's true or not. Oh yes, we're going there today, right? This paper is many things. It's not just paper, right? 
It's also blue paper over here, right? It's also a notebook. I, when I hold this up and I say, what is this? Your perception may tell you book. His perception may tell him notebook. My perception may say paper bound together, okay? Whatever my perception is, it doesn't matter. Does it change what this really is just because I tell you what it is? So because if your perception tells you that this is something different than what someone else says, it doesn't make it different. It's just how you said it. And that's why when people don't want to come out of comfort zones and they don't want to learn anything else and they don't want to hear anything else because they're so shut down from the truth, that's where you get cut off from the truth because you manifest what you perceive. So if you perceive limitation, ah, ah, ow, that's what you get. That's what you get. So that is why on page 169, you need to learn about boundary setting, right? People that feel like they don't have time. I don't know if I can, I don't, mm, 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 right? Perception, change your perception. Now I'm going to break down each of the agreements and somewhere as I'm breaking the agreements down and what you're going to do with the agreement. Sorry, I just saw myself dancing. Um, when I break these agreements down to you, I am also going to break down why you make agreements instead of affirmations and when to use which. So let me do that real fast. Affirmations are not necessarily agreements, but agreements are most certainly affirmations, meaning an agreement is something that you are stating as though it were, and you're stating it to firm, make it firm, right, in your mind. You see, I started thinking about this, this the other day. I recognize that every thought that you have in your mind is what you manifest. That, that was where that whole perception thing came from earlier when I was talking about that which you perceive, you manifest, right? If you perceive God as everything, then you become filled with God. That's called enthusiasm. Everything that you do becomes enthused. There's become, the joy flows through everything, right? Enthusiasm in being inside of you, th thus or theos, thus, theos, God, right? And asm, you're filled with, right? So you're filled with God or uh, God flows through you. There's a lot of different translations, but that's where we're going with this etymology. Okay. So an agreement is, let me tell you, an agreement is a, is a lifetime, okay? An agreement lasts a lifetime. It's a bond, right? What happens when you get married? You're making an agreement, for better or for worse. You're making an agreement. I'm sorry, did I make a face? So that being said, an agreement lasts a lifetime and affirmation lasts until you've created that reality, right? My agreement for this week, because I told everyone to make an agreement, is I agree to stay present. And that is my week, my agreement this week. And so all week, no matter what I do, I have agreed that that's what I'm going to do. Now, it's functioning as an affirmation in the sense that if I forget to continue to agree that, then of course, I no longer am letting my agreement serve its purpose because an agreement is set in stone. When you make an agreement, it's like a, a contract that you're making with yourself. So once you agree to it, you've got to go forward and do it. Now, an affirmation is not something that you must do. It's something that you would like to manifest. An affirmation is also a way, if you want to manifest presence, then of course, now your affirmation is I am present, which is the same as the agreement of I am agreeing that I am present, right? It's the same thing. But an affirmation typically serves to function for something that could also be temporary. An agreement will not be temporary. An agreement is made as if it will be permanent. 
right? When are you gonna not stay present for the rest of your life? I just wanna be present for the next three weeks. After that, I would like to go back to moping. I mean, that makes no sense. But an affirmation might be, I affirm that I'm living in the house of my dreams. Well, once you have the house of your dreams, you need to keep affirming it. No, I mean, not necessarily. I guess you could. I guess you could to make sure it stays there, but you don't, it's not necessary. You're done with that affirmation, all right? So an agreement is something that you make for life. And that is why it is so hard to break the ones you already have. Amen. Let me, let me put some clear coat on my polish while I'm talking to you. I'm putting the clear coat on. Okay, so that being said, Don Miguel Ruiz proposes that all of the agreements that you've made with yourself that you don't even know that you've made, that you're probably unaware that you've made, guys, and the, and the revelations are astounding as they start coming in, when you start realizing the agreements that you've really made, because you do this in layers now. You work on this in layers. So when you start really seeing the agreements you've really made, your head will be blown. I mean, when you allow your mind to open up to the level that you'll be so honest with yourself, that you're so discerning with yourself and not judgmental with yourself. I'm not just talking about other people, honey. That which you perceive, you manifest. So if you are up here perceiving judgment with people, then guess who you're judging? The first, the first one you're judging. You're judging yourself. That's what this is about. This is about you versus you. So right now, in order for you to sort of Right now, in order for you to cast out your demons, if you will, right now, in order for you to replace your old life with your new life, you have to, first of all, figure out an inventory of the agreements that you've already made. It takes too long. So he's like, look, bump that. You're going to instead replace your agreements with other agreements that are stronger and really will help eradicate all of the other agreements anyways, because when you do them, there's no way to turn back. Like, I agree to stay present takes the place of, I don't want to be sad in the past. I don't want to have anxiety in the future. It, like, that agreement take, takes care of all that, right? So that's why we make agreements. So the first agreement is being impeccable with your word. Why the word? Why the word? Contrary to people's belief that the word means a written word, the word actually means a spoken word. Etymologically, if you break down the word word, the word is also, the, the bird is also the word, you know. So, uh, <laughs> the word that, <laughs> I'm sorry, family guy. The word is what you speak. Now, of course, in your mind, when you have thoughts, you are perceiving the word as well. You're just not perceiving it spoken. You're perceiving it as a thought, right? So anytime you speak a word first, it must be what first? A thought. So now when you speak a word, it was a thought first, and now it comes out of your mind. And now not only does everyone else hear you, you get to hear yourself. So your word, anytime it is spoken, is amplified by three. The spoken word is powerful. The spoken word is powerful. It's amplified by three every time you speak it. So the word must be impeccable, impeccable, clean, without sin, right? Clean, without sin, right? And of course, the etym etymology of sin, we know, is to go against or to, uh, to be ignorant, right? That's the real etymological behind that word, if you'd like to know. So that being said, if your word is that powerful, and we talked about thoughts being powerful, right? Why are thoughts powerful? Because your thoughts, which are light energy, which vibrate at the, nearly the same, nearly. Your thoughts vibrate at nearly the same, but whatever, they're light, they're light, right? Your thoughts are not dense objects. Your thoughts are, tr are transient light, not even light. They're like less, they're like less than light. Like they're like vapor. Your thoughts are simple connections made in the brain that you perceive as information or ideas or you perceive it with your mind. You cannot perceive your thought with your eyes. You cannot perceive your thoughts with your mouth, okay, to, by tasting them. You cannot perceive your thoughts by sound. You can only perceive your thoughts in the mind. So they are very light objects, obviously, light forms of matter that we can barely describe. So if you've got something that's light, and if God works in the space of nothingness or no thingness, then of course, that which is manifested in the physical world had to come from something light first. It had to, as above, so below. Come on now. So if any, and, and of course, last week when we talked about discernment, we talked about the way that something as light as a thought could be compressed like carbon and be made into a physical object. We know that that is actually physically possible. Why not with your thoughts? Absolutely. Same rhetoric applies right? To taking a gas and making it into a solid. The same thing applies with your thoughts, right? So that being said, when your thoughts now manifest as a word, which is also not physical, but it does manifest through the perception of sound, 
We can still now say that thought, that words, which are now more dense, more real than thoughts now to people because everyone can hear what you're saying. Not everybody can hear the thoughts in your head, hopefully, unless they're psychic. There's no one that can hear the thoughts in your head, but everyone can hear the thoughts that come out of your mouth right? But guess who gets to hear the thoughts first? That would, that would be you. So anytime that you manifest a thought that is ill, that is sick, and I don't mean it like in hip hop where that's ill, that's dope. No, I mean what dope and ill really means, which is you sick for real. When you manifest a thought that is negative, whether it be spoken or thought only in your mind, you are now receiving poison. That's poison right if your thoughts are clean impeccable if your thoughts are, po are positive and happy guess what you are now doing you are now lifting uplifting you are now filling with light you are now healing if you will okay so if you've got the word then you've got a tool of magic right we talked about etymology we talked like if you go back to week six you're going to understand why spelling is called spelling spell casting a spell through the word, okay, come on now. Now this is the written word, but we, we got it, we got the point. The point is, when your mind is, first of all, your mind is as, uh, I mean, as Don Miguel Ruiz says, your mind is fertile ground where scales, spells can be cast and you don't even know it. That's the scary part. You don't even know that someone's casting a spell on you. But if somebody tells you you're ugly and you agree, Right? How do you agree? Because you have said that you're ugly. You've agreed with them. Anytime that you say you're ugly and someone else says you're ugly, now you've told yourself that you're ugly. Now they've told you that you're ugly. You already think you're ugly. Now the two of you are in agreement. What's an agreement? A contract. You two have made a contract that, yeah, you're pretty ugly. We both agree. That being said, if that thought is negative, if that ugliness makes you feel bad about yourself, now you've accepted poison. You've ingested poison. So the word is important because how you disseminate that word is how people are going to receive you, receive your energy, your energy, which again is inseparable from where God resides, your actual energy, right? It's inseparable. That's where God is able to talk to you through that energy. So if you utilize your energy for malintent, whether ignorant of it or not, you can you can expel poison from your body. That's what you're doing. Gossip. People write on websites. There's something called, I think, Lipstick Alley. People have written atrocious things about me. People have made fun of my lisp. First of all, I know I have a lisp. Like, I, I, I don't even, you know, care about that. But what ends up happening is they utilize it to judge you or to make you into a bad person. Your lisp. Or how you dress. You're now a bad person because I don't agree with your outfit. And then of course you take someone like a Kim Kardashian or a Beyonce and people tear them to shreds every day on the site. Every day. I have gone on the sites and, and said stuff that I shouldn't have said. But that's my word. And over time, the amount of people pouring in negative words eventually is going to manifest something negative. Why? Because everyone's thoughts are on it. So you put all that powerful human energy together, you manifest eventually in some way, shape or form, whatever your malintent is, it's deep, right? So this is unfair, right? We don't do that. We talk about discernment. You have to make the discernment that you're not going to post on someone, but this is the way that we use the word for negative intent. This is how we cast a negative spell. If we are impeccable with our word, then we can't do that. You see, one thing I try to be conscious of on this channel is I try very, very consciously. I try. It ain't, I know it's not perfect, but I try very hard to separate what I'm telling someone to do from what I do myself. Because if I haven't done it, I have no right to say it. And that way my word can be impeccable because it will be my truth. And that way I could stand by it. Even years later when I could say, you know what? I, I probably did not know in that time. I was ignorant. I didn't know. I could still be impeccable with my, my word because as long as you are constantly impeccable with your word you get better with it over time because it's practice right so that being said anytime you expel drama to someone else you are expelling drama to yourself that was when I said to you that first in order for you to say a bad word about somebody first is a thought in your head then it becomes a word out of your mouth which goes back to you twice through each ear 
Now that is amplified three times. Now to that other individual that's taking the poison from you, theirs is not going to be as amplified as what you receive from what you've said. Why, Shira? Because it starts with you first. It emanates from you. You wouldn't say something that doesn't resonate with you. For example, I don't think like a murderer, so I'm not going to make comments that murderers make, probably. Chances are very high, right? If I'm in a situation and I'm in a group with a bunch of, let's say I'm going to a prison and I'm going to go talk to some murderers and I'm going to go do a seminar. That's a really good idea. But anyways, let's say I'm going to a prison, I'm doing a seminar and I'm talking to the inmates, right? And they have all these horrible things. That is such a good idea. And they have all these things to say about murder. Is my mind going to understand their world of murder? No, I haven't murdered physically. Who knows, but you, but you, in order to murder physically, you mur must murder the person in here too. And guess who you murder first? Your own mind. Their physical body may be gone, but you're left on earth to deal. So that being said, anytime that you disseminate the word negatively, right, it's coming from you first. And as I said, as with a murderer, only a murderer knows how to disseminate murder. If you've never murdered, then you don't know how to murder. It's really quite that simple. Right? So if, if, if it's come out of you that someone's ugly, you must think that you're ugly. There's an aspect of you. Because there's no reason for me to call somebody ugly if I, wouldn't, if I wouldn't believe it about myself first. Right? If somebody's a non-threat, they're just a non-threat. They're a non-factor. Why would I even say anything about them? Right? So to acknowledge is to, in other words, to acknowledge the threat of the other individual is to also acknowledge the aspect of yourself, which is the ego which is the one that would say something like that because only the ego would perceive in that way to begin with, right? It can't come out of your mouth if you don't ever, if you've never seen, you can't think about something you've never seen before, right? Or you've never experienced before. So you've experienced this. Now, maybe you don't think you're ugly, but there's something about the, what you did with that word that comes back to you in something that you think fundamentally about yourself. Right. You may not think you're ugly, but maybe you're insecure. And so maybe by calling someone ugly, you're basically trying to make them insecure, which you already are. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not necessarily just about the word. It's about the intention behind what you're doing as reflective of you. And people aren't going to see that. People are going to continue to gossip, continue to spread things, continue to be nasty to one another. You don't have to accept someone's word. And when you don't, then then you no longer are fertile ground to accept those other agreements that you don't actually agree with. Now you can make a discernment between what you choose to agree with and what you choose not to agree with.
next agreement. Don't take anything personally. Now, if you can be impe impeccable with your word, you can break 75% of the agreements that you've already made with yourself. Being, uh, not taking anything personally will nearly take out the other 25%. Why? Because once again, in order for you <coughs> to be fertile ground for a negative word to come into your atmosphere and for you to believe it, the only way to do that is to take it personal. Don't take things personally. Why do you not take things personally? Because what everyone does is always about them. It's never about you. Even to the extent, and he says this in here, even to the extent that someone murders you, it's not about you. But wait, Shira, they killed me. So I know it's about me. No, it's not. Once again, your mind is the one that conceives of all this stuff in the first place. Not someone else. No one makes you do anything. You don't have to murder someone. It's on you no matter what it is because you have the warrior mindset that you are not going to let these things overtake you no matter how much, no matter how bad it hurts. Why is that important? Because you can no longer take it personal, Shara. You guys can no longer take it personal. If somebody is trying to rob you of your dream, why is that, we learned? Because they're afraid of living their own dream, right? Just any old way to make you, make you feel like you're part of the group, that's what they're going to do. You're not going to go do anything out of the norm. You're going to want to stay and go with the flow. And if everybody around you is sad, why should you be happy? I'm spraying my nails off, right? So that agreement about don't, not taking things personal, it's really easy. You only take, a per, what he says is you only take personal what you personally agree with. Amen. You can't take it personal if it doesn't apply to you, right? Someone tells me I'm ugly, but I'm not. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I don't believe it. I don't manifest it. It's not part of my vocabulary. If I call myself ugly for a joke, I probably shouldn't even do that. But you know, on the, on the, on the wavelength of the fact that I am a comedian, I am going to do that sometimes because I think it's funny. It's not what I believe. You know, I don't believe it. Ain't nobody that believes they're ugly going to really put this much effort into their look. I guess they could. I guess they could. Let me not say that. See, now that's making an assumption. That's the third agreement. Let me shut, let me shut up. But my point is, when you take it personal, you are now saying I agree with it. So now, when you make the agreement to not take it personal, you're saying, I don't agree with that. No matter what it is. I don't care if somebody says to you, you're the most beautiful person on the earth. I know what I am. So if you think I'm beautiful, I'm so happy that you agree. But you disagree with what I already agree with with myself, right? So taking it personal, if someone gives you an opinion and you take it personal, you have now agreed with them. Does that make sense? I'll say it again. If someone says to you, you know what? You came to work today and I really ain't like your attitude that you had. Did you just tell me I had attitude? I didn't have attitude. That response right there, that, that rebuttal that you just did, you just agreed with them. Because if it's invalid, it's invalid. I said it before. If a woman is not a threat to you, then she's a non-factor, right? Like Evelyn Lozada said. Now, we're not gonna reference her in this video. <laughs> We can reference her on Ayanla, but on vision class, we just, what are you trying to say, Shara? My point is this. If I am with my man, and I don't have a man, if I was with my man and he was walking me through, you know, Fifth Avenue and a pack of Brazilian models walks by and he turns his head and he goes and follows them, right? Okay, then he is now agreeing that he likes those women more than he likes me. Does that change whether or not I'm fabulous? No, only it was on him whether or not he chose to leave, but I should not have lost my fabulosity if I don't take it personally. If I don't take it personally, if I know I'm bad, I'm bad regardless of what he does. Those girls could be bad too, but I'm also bad in my own right. So there's no way that him walking away from me needs to be taken personal because you don't change who I am just because you choose to do something different. That's taking it personal. And that's why you don't take it personal. Because nothing that anyone could ever do is about you. There's nothing that anyone could ever do that's about you. They live in their own mind. We all live in our own minds. Everything we do is about us. Everything. Even if we sacrifice. I sacrifice. Look, in my relationships, I sacrificed so hard to give him everything that he wanted. And he didn't love me. Well, guess what? That's because I was sacrificing for me, right? I, I sacrificed myself for myself. I didn't sacrifice myself for him. How could you love someone that you don't love? Didn't RuPaul tell you if you don't love yourself, then how in the hell are you going to love anybody else? Can I get an amen? You can't. So even if you sacrifice for someone else, guess who you're sacrificing for? You. And if you're in love with somebody and they don't love you, 
and you're still with them, then you don't love yourself. That's the real truth. So you don't really love them either. It's all personal. And that's why you can't take it personal. Don't make assumptions. I'm telling you guys, this is going to be hard to, to, to stay vigilant of, but if you do, I'm guaranteeing you personal success, right? So you don't make assumptions. What is an assumption? Assumption is what you believe is the truth. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It's what you believe is the truth. Assumptions are what we believe are true, right? Have you ever made an assumption? I'll give you a great assumption. I'm driving down the street. Yeah, my nails are wet. I'm driving down the street. Somebody cuts me off. First reaction. Well, why would you do that? You, what, do you got a problem? Huh? Didn't you see I was in this lane? Right? And, and then you go off and you make a whole thing of assumptions. And really, the person in the car, the only reason they cut over was because the person in the seat next to them had a knife and they was trying to kill him. And they was just trying to, you know, do a sneak attack real fast and, and throw the knife person off. I don't know. But you don't know what's going on in that car is what I'm trying to tell you. Because what's going on in that car is personal to them. They're not paying attention to you no matter what they're doing. Even if they were, let me try not to cut them off. How many times, oh my God, I've seen this. I've seen this happen too many times to give you this great example. How many times have you seen somebody, right? You've seen both sides of the story of what's really going on. So you're an outsider, but you're seeing how somebody is taking things the wrong way. For example, I had someone tell me that they didn't like somebody because they talk too much and that they think they know everything. Right? I'm watching them tell me, well, they think they know everything. Then I'm watching the person who talks too much and thinks they know everything say, you know, I just love to talk a lot. And so, and I talk because I'm insecure. How is that could be not any more too, how could that, how could both sides of those stories be any more different from one another? They're actually insecure. You think they think they know every damn thing. And so both of y'all is up here thinking two different things and you're making an assumption off of this person based off of what you think and this person is making an assumption off of why they talk so much. Well, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to, um, I'm talking so much because I think everybody, you know, I'm insecure. And by you saying that you're insecure and that's why you talk so much, you're also technically making the assumption that everyone around you is secure. It's secure. Right? I mean, technically, if you take it far enough, you can start seeing how assumptions affect everything. And that's why you don't know you do them. And that's what you believe is the truth. Because I'm insecure. So because you believe you're insecure, you're also making the assumption that everyone else is, is secure. Because in, who, in comparison to whom are you insecure? It's always in comparison to someone. You can't just be insecure by yourself in your house. You're insecure in relation to something. The reason why we make assumptions, he breaks it all down, is because we want to replace the need for communication. We're afraid to clarify, right? We're afraid somebody's gonna make a fool out of us. We're afraid to go against the grain. We talked about this last week. We're afraid that we're gonna be different from somebody else or we're not gonna be accepted or we're afraid of rejection. So we assume so that we can fill the place of the work that it takes to ask a question. How many times have you been somewhere and somebody was doing something messed up but you just didn't wanna say anything to step on their toes, right? Like maybe, you know, have you ever been in a situation? Now, some of y'all are gonna be like, no. Of course I've never been. I, t I say what's on my mind. Okay, well, any of you docile folks out there like myself who are in a situation with somebody who's now, or just not even docile, you might just be, uh, you know, unassuming, not imposing. So maybe, you know, you're, you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, uh, let's say you're talking to your boss. Get over there and work that nine to five, right? And you're talking to your boss and you're going to work on Friday, right? You're speaking to your boss and your boss says to you, oh, you're going to work on Friday, right? And you don't like the tone that they just spoke to you, but you don't really know how to approach it. I don't really like what she just said to me, but 
I'm just not going to say anything because if I say something to her, she's probably going to fire me. And so you just go back to working on Friday, right? That's, but that was an assumption. What if she respected you for standing up for yourself? And I never heard anyone say that to me before. You take Friday off. Or she could say to you, you know what, honestly, I'm so glad you came and said something. I really don't want this job anymore. You want this job? You're making an assumption. You don't know what she's going to say, right? And even if you didn't know what she was going to say, it doesn't matter because you didn't go clarify. That was the real point. You still didn't go clarify. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what answer that someone gives you. The whole point is we want to feel secure. Right? That's why, again, we make assumptions because we feel insecure. We don't want to be that part on the outcrowd, right? So if you don't know how to ask questions of somebody, if you don't know how to get clarification, excuse me, um, I don't know why you were yelling at me and I'm just, I'm just trying to get clarification because I want to make sure that A, I didn't do anything wrong and B, that I don't need to quit because I don't like your attitude, right? So you could come up to the boss and, and holler at her like that. I'm just having a really bad day. Um, I didn't mean to talk. You know, you don't know. But nobody wants to ask these questions because if you ask the question, you stand out from the pack, right? If you ask the if you ask the question so that you don't have to make an assumption, the real truth is you are actually opening your mind, and that's another reason people don't ask questions. They'd rather assume because they feel safe in their own mind, making up their own answers to everything, right? Having their own opinions. Well, you know, my personal opinion is Kim shouldn't have wore that dress on Friday. That's just what I think. Oh, is it just what you think? Or do everybody need to listen to you because you are, you know, personal importance, right? You think you're so important. I, yes. You know what? I agree. Right? That validation. Right? So that's why, you know, if, and if people make assumptions and then they're verbal about the assumptions they're making and a whole bunch of people agree, they feel better about their assumption. Whew. All right. Got that off my chest, right? So, and we do this all the time. This is not something that we do consciously. We are constantly making assumptions. Just like, sometimes people don't go out in public. I don't wanna be seen in that outfit. Everyone's gonna think I'm a weirdo. Well, Carrie Bradshaw didn't think everyone was a weirdo. Everyone didn't think Carrie Bradshaw was a weirdo. Now she walks down the street in her Prada uh, tool skirt with a t-shirt on. Everyone, that looks amazing. Because now Carrie Bradshaw has made it cool not to care, right? Why is that? Why is that important? That is important because we unconsciously assume that people are going to judge us when we just should just be, right? And if we could just be, then we don't have to make assumptions about what anyone wants to think about us because we don't have to take it personal. Because who cares? Who cares? I'm gonna be me. I know who I am, right? So, oh. So this idea of asking questions about probing, this now extends to how we perceive ourselves. You see, we don't take the time with ourselves to figure ourselves out. So we're going to go ahead and make assumptions about ourselves. That's where this gets deep, right? Because yeah, I could make an assumption that this person cut me off and I could be mad at them and I could, then I can make a whole story out of it, right? You cut me off. Um, I don't like you. I have road rage now. Now I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. That's how far it gets though, an assumption. That's how far an assumption goes. I'll actually murder you off of this assumption, right? Oh, she, she he, he cheated on me, right? He, he, he straight cheated on me. So I'm making an assumption that, you know, he cheated on me. I don't know if he has cheated on me, but sometimes the belief is all it takes. Well, I see his phone ringing all night and you go look for him, you know, hunt him down because you assumed he's cheating and you go and find out he's not cheating at all. He's not even out with his boys. His phone died or whatever. I don't know. I'm calling him all these times. He ain't picking up the phone. He must be cheating. And you go come to find out he ain't cheating. His phone died. Have you ever had that happen where you're like, oh, my bad. Okay, so that is why you ask questions. So, but this goes deeper. This goes inside of you, right? So if you can make the agreement not to make assumptions, then guess what you now have done? You have strengthened your own ability inside of yourself to tell yourself the truth. And assumptions, again, they protect, it's like they shroud all of these agreements that you've made, right? That's the thing about an assumption. They help, like, you know, they help buffer everything else. Like, oh, oh yeah, I, yeah, I knew everybody was against me. All right, yeah, that's why I shouldn't read A New Earth. I knew it. I knew they was trying to, you know, without knowing the full story, because you can never know the full story. That's what he, that's what Don Miguel Ruiz says is the remedy to this agreement. 
always assume that you don't know everything. That's what you do assume. You assume that you don't know everything about a given subject. You assume that you always ask questions. And once you ask questions, still don't assume that you know everything. That's how you do it. That's how you check your mind. If I'm sitting up here and I'm saying to you guys right now, look, in order for you to be discerning, you have to constantly make the decision to look at yourself. That is, in essence, no longer making an assumption even about yourself. Let me tell you some assumptions we make about ourselves that apply to vision class. I can't do it. I won't be able to manifest that vision. Why would God give that to me? Why should I be able to quit my job? I just, it doesn't seem right. That's an assumption y'all all make about yourself. That's why you're in this class. So just know that we all make the assumption that we can't do it. But we have to ask questions. How do I know I can't do it? I don't know. All right, that's a great question to begin with. Keep asking. Because as long as you keep asking, guess what you're doing? You're clarifying. Guess what you're doing? You're becoming impeccable with your word. Thus, you are no longer becoming assumptive about all of the situations surrounding you because you know the answer. That's why you can't assume. Because when you know the answer, you're not making an ass out of you and me anymore. You are no longer assuming. You are now telling the truth. And even when you tell the truth as far as you can tell it, there's more truth behind it. That's why you open your mind in vision class. Because everything that you know already is not automatic truth. That's also an assumption that it's automatic truth. Is it so? Ask a question and see if you don't find out a different answer. Because I guarantee you, if you keep asking the question, you will see a different answer. As I teach, I can teach something 10 different ways to 10 different people because I constantly see the truth in things. Because you cannot assume that once you know something, you know everything. Even the world champion of ballroom still tells me right now, I always go inside myself and ask myself, what can I do? That means he's not assuming that he's the best forever. I, I know what I'm doing right now, but I can always go inside and look, and look deeper. That's how you'd break that agreement. when you're enjoying the action. You cannot always do your best in every circumstances. There's something my therapist calls halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you're feeling any of those emotions, your best is different. Your best changes over time. But your best is your ability to say to yourself, I agree that I am doing my best right now. If you can say that at any moment, I don't care what moment it is, shoot, when I was getting slapped silly in New York City, my best in that moment was what I did. So I don't regret when people look back. I don't know if you should have been. Er, I was there. It happened. I did it. I'm, wor I'm not worried about it. Okay. Er. See the hand. So what I'm trying to say about that is because people, oh, you should regret that. No, I'm not going to regret it. It happened. In that moment, I did what I could. And because I'm cognizant of that, I feel better. And guess what? Over time, doing your best eventually becomes, not perfection, but doing your best means you're always vigilant. You're always conscious. You're always aware, which the point of this class is awareness. Amen? So you want to make sure that your actions are full, filled with God, filled with happiness, filled with joy, which is why you do vision class, so that you can do the things in your life that are fulfilling. My job is to teach ballroom dance. Do you think I'm not fulfilled when I prayed for that for five years? Rather, I prayed that for five years. I prayed that. I didn't pray for that. I prayed that. I pray that now. Why? Because I want to keep manifesting this reality. I don't have to go to work and hate my job. Do you know how many people go to work and hate their job? I don't have to. And I manifested that. And it's a real job. And we get to travel sometimes. How you doing? That being said, um, what you guys are going to want to do is just really fast. Uh, I'm not going to go over this right now because time is definitely up. But when you read through the rest of breaking through old agreements and when you are talking about um 
when you're reading the rest of the four agreements, all of my notes will be available to you. So that way you can look at my notes. But really the main thing you want to remind yourself is that in order to master your freedom of your mind, you start with awareness. That's where this class starts. So that's why this class is a great building block. Then you transform. This class also helps you to transform. It helps you to become your new self, shifting. Okay, and number three is your, is your love, right? How you love. Love which is unconditional. That is the hardest one to do. So you're gonna to wanna to read, um, you're going to read about this in chapter six of the four agreements. The last thing I really, really, really want you to take home, really important, is what you're gonna notice in chapter seven is called the new dream heaven on earth. Now, if you take out the words dream and heaven, you have the new earth. You also heard about a new earth in Eckhart Tolle and you also heard about a new earth in um, Greg Braden. There's no coincidence that this, this theme keeps coming up. And this new earth is also in your biblical uh, text, right? Why do we keep hearing about a new earth? It is subliminally, it is a constant way of saying to you, your new mind, your new self, right? Your new dream, your new reality. This is all subconscious ways of saying that. Why? Because even God knew, <laughs> even God knew, I don't even say God knew, even God has the intention of having human beings understand that. That's why it is infiltrating everything that you're reading in some way or the other, talking about a new earth, the new earth. So just keep in mind that as you manifest a new self, you manifest your new earth, everything around you, right? Even the actual earth will shift to match the individuals on the planet who are shifting. I'm going to go now. I know that we talked about the agreements, but the idea this week is to set a new agreement with yourself. Tell yourself who you're going to be, what you're going to do, what way of life you're going to manifest, and make sure it is a lifelong goal. I agree to be present. I agree to be aware. I agree to learn new things. This is something that you are always doing. This agreement also will serve to replace all of the agreements that you don't like that you've made and all of the agreements that you don't know that you've made that are keeping you trapped in your mind. And through these agreements, constant reminders of them. Put a post-it up. Write it on your, uh, write it on your mirror in your, in your bathroom with erasable chalk. And, just, and, and, and write it with that erasable crayon that you, know, that you can wipe off. And just look at it every day until you do it. Practice makes the master, as he said. So practice is what you are going to do. Practice these agreements. I guarantee you, where you are in, in four weeks is not going to be where you were with day one. Look back at your first beginning of vision class and look at yourself now. Practice makes the master. All right, so join us next week, week 11. We're almost done. We're going to talk about belief. We're about to go in. Peace and peace.